gonna be much longer, son? Nah, not much longer. Hello, good evening, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Cinnamon Spaces. Today, I'm joined by three amazing speakers. So first, we have Cinnamon CEO, John Cavallo. John, please introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, obviously, yes, I'm CEO at Synonym, and we're doing this spaces today because a big part of what we do as a company is also trying to fix the web, I guess you could say, and show how to use it in a more self-sovereign way by combining it with Bitcoin for a store of value. Fantastic. And in case you didn't know, Synonym is a Bitcoin company that's developing an ecosystem of software products and protocols for hyper-Bitcoinization. So our second and third speaker um, are Synonym's web specialists. So first of all, we have Grokchain. Grokchain, please introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, hi, uh, Grokchain on the Synonym side. I've uh, been in software engineering for 20 odd years. I consider myself a bit of a digital anarchist, a lot into the free and open software movement, and also on the Bitcoin side, man, and hacking some cool stuff at Synonym. Fantastic. And then uh, we have R, but he will join a little bit later on, uh, who's also from the Synonym team. Today's topic is a web of lies. We'll discuss the past, the present, and the future of web technology, and some of the misconceptions around the term like Web3 or what Web5 is, and how Synonym is trying to improve the web with slash tags. Okay, let's move into the questions for today. For for the first part, we're going to talk a little bit about Web1 and Web2, where it all came from and so on. So I think the first one, we kind of start over with, with Grokchain. Um, how, in your opinion, did the web start? What were some of the ideals of what we now call the Web1? Can you enlighten us a little bit? Yeah, sure, man. So perhaps not an opinion, more of a, a bit of a history lesson there. Uh, for that, uh, I've been in the website since about the mid '90s, um, and prior to that, you had uh, the likes of uh, Sir Tim Berners Lee, uh, who was working at CERN, and uh, one of his concerns at that stage is the internet had become quite prolific, uh, and just to distinguish or disambiguate. Uh, the internet is pretty much just a IP network uh, used for communication and a very popular first application that took off on the internet back uh, back in those days was kind of uh, email. And uh, one of one of um, Tim's frustrations was uh, the siloing of documents and, and being able to intershare that within the departments at CERN and kind of the universities and things that were part of the first uh, version of the internet. Uh, so something he came up with uh, in the early 80s was something called Inquire, which can kind of be considered uh, the birth of the internet. And there were also other competing protocols like the Gopher protocol, which were used for indexing documents across the web. Uh, but something Tim had realized at that stage is that there's no uniform or standard way for people to actually express content in, in a way. Uh, so he came up with the first draft of what we know as uh, the World Wide Web today, which is an overlay protocol on top of the internet. And that typically consists of uh, three, three important components. Uh, the first is uh, considering it's going to be a, a client-server environment, uh, the server typically where you would store the information and clients for interpreting that. Uh, and he broke that down into saying, well, we need a, a, a conversation mechanism. So HTTP, which is the hypertext transfer protocol, was put into place. And then he also came up with a way in which you can express and, and visualize content. And, and that, as we know today, is HTML or the hypertext markup language. Uh, once you've got those two together, you can pretty much host these HTML files on servers and then also developing a client for interpreting or parsing these HTML files to give you a visual representation of the content. Uh, he also developed like the first uh, browser. Um, 
the next step you had there was obviously addressing and and finding the, uh, this content. And as we know, uh, with the IP uh, networking side of things, it's not too friendly to find content by using these long numbers, like typically in IPv4 or, or TCP IP. Uh, you might want to address that server through an IP address, uh, but then naming became important. So, for example, uh, today you'd go to google.com and you won't go to like 8.8.8. .8 .8. Uh, it's just much, much more difficult for people to interpret. Uh, so he also came up with something called the UDI, which was a universal document identifier, but that has subsequently been moved into what we call URLs. Uh, and those are those friendly, like HTTP colon slash slash dub 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 dot uh, google dot com, which, which was quite foreign at the time. But with those three things, you pretty much could open up for people to contribute content online without really having to ask permission. Uh, and you could start sharing information between each other. But a very important innovation in that stack is at the HTML side, which is the presentation layer, he came up with the concept of linking. Uh, so anyone in, uh, around the world could basically host one of these pages and share their ideas, but then they could also interlink to other ideas that were being shared across the web through uh, introducing a hyperlink into the page. And uh, fortunately, it was decided at the time that that would be opened up as a non-proprietary contribution, more of a, a philanthropy um, from CERN's side in becoming open standards. So we don't really need to pay royalties or anything for using that. And that was really the, the beginnings of uh, the first kind of web as we know it today. And, and that's, um, I think, in hindsight, what everybody referred to as Web 1. Amazing. John uh, and R, do you want to add something on the ideals of what we call now the Web 1? Well, I don't have too much technical to add. I mean, uh, Grok Chain's covering it all pretty well. I did start using the internet and web around the same time, maybe uh, maybe a few years earlier than the mid-90s. Um, I had a computer from a very young age, and I was using bulletin board systems and America Online and Prodigy Net and these other kind of early forms of centralized, I guess you could say, web. But, you know, th there was a lot of the primitives that we'll discuss as we go through the questions today and you know describe each of these like different versions of the web a lot of the primitives were kind of always there in a way or at least were there from a very early state and i think you'll find like when we start talking about newer concepts and decentralizing the web that some of what we're doing is just kind of backtracking on some of the habits and cultures that we have kind of cornered ourselves into that we could have always done in the first place, but didn't really focus on those areas. Like things like, for example, um, domain names and DNS. Like if you'll, you'll, you'll notice that some of the tech that we'll talk about later is using public key pairs for things for addressing. And so we're kind of backtracking a bit to going back to using numbers, but we have kind of a, a better way of handling these numbers than we used to in the past. And we're kind of more accustomed to rendering these numbers into nicknames or domain names or, uh, you know, easy to use, you know, terms. And we have a little more flexibility, a little more understanding to how we can kind of provide user experiences that mask these numbers. And so I would just say, just keep that in mind as we as we talk about the different stages that, you know, a lot of this stuff was kind of always possible. And that in the end, the internet is just computers talking to computers and, you know, a server and a client is really no different if you have both on the same computer. And that's what the peer to peer web concepts really are. It's just everybody having all the capabilities. Nice. So out of CERN and the Web 1 kind of grew what we now call the Web 2. So how do we end up with Web 2 and what are some of the implications that we have on the current capabilities and the infrastructure of the Web? How, how did Web 2 influence that? Um, Grokchain, yeah. will you answer first? Yeah, sure, man. So I believe it was uh, towards 1994. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, kind of started a, a consortium today known as the uh, Web3 Consortium, uh, W3C. And the idea of this consortium was really to coordinate between various vendors 
to develop standards that would allow them to develop applications for the purpose of interoperability. Uh, we kind of had browser wars back in the day. You, you had like uh, the Mosaic browser, which was one of the first ones. Uh, you had Netscape coming about. Uh, Internet Explorer was also kind of like starring at the day. Um, but for these vendors to be able to develop browsers, uh, they all needed to decide on, a, on these common standards so that if they implement them, uh, you, you know, you could kind of go and visit these various pages, but they weren't incompatible with each other. So you can pretty much interchange between Internet Explorer, any one of them. Uh, and even today, as we've seen prolifically with like the Chrome browser, uh, Firefox, these kinds of things, uh, all these would interpret these pages and standards based off of these specifications. And um, with, with the coming of age of uh, e-commerce, uh, content management systems, blogs, uh, in about 2004, the realization came that uh, there's a lot more interoperability and uh, interactiveness required between these various websites. Uh, so you saw things like web services, uh, SOAP being kind of a XML-based uh, interchange protocol. Uh, we saw REST-based web services, and these really allowed vendors to start exposing uh, application logic or business logic from their various websites. Um, during that stage as well, uh, there was actually a period at which cookies, like it was making the news that cookies were quite harmful to users. Uh, users were, st were starting to disable that by default. Uh, you had the coming of age of dynamically requesting uh, to these back office services, their web services uh, like SOAP and REST, uh, where the web page could programmatically make a call to the back office, pull data, and then present that to the user. But more importantly is what the user was also able to actually post data back to these back offices through what we called like a common gateway interface or CGI. A lot of the, those things have evolved over the time, uh, but generally it was understood that the first rendition of the web was considered a read-only web. So the publisher would put out their content through HTML pages. Uh, that started getting a bit more involved where you might get a database backend involved to actually uh, generate the content and generate these HTML pages. And then with the web services layer to it uh, and the advent of being able to do these dynamic calls, uh, from a marketing perspective, it was kind of insisted that uh, I think the W3C in 2004 coined the term Web2. And that was very much trying to encapsulate and describe uh, this whole movement that was happening. Uh, so in short, and I think also just to add on to what John was saying with public key cryptography, uh, I, I believe it was in the 80s and 90s, there, there was a big question around cryptography and the regulation around allowing the export of cryptography. I think if you have a look at like GPG, etc., uh, there were stages where people were actually publishing uh, cryptographic protocols in books to be able to get them over the border. Uh, because the regs, et cetera, didn't really allow you to export that stuff over the internet. And you could overcome that with publishing it in books because uh, that was kind of like seen as an educational thing. Uh, but generally, yeah, the, the second version of the web was being considered to be a more interactive version of the web where it was not just read, it was more of a, a read-write kind of scenario. Uh, and we also saw the coming of age of certificate authorities uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, where you had the likes of VeriSign uh, and Thought. I think both of them were founded in 1995. Uh, Thought actually founded by a, a co-South African called Mark Shuttleworth. And the idea there was that uh, because we started accepting things like credit cards online, uh, HTTP itself is a clear text protocol, uh, and you don't want sensitive or, or kind of like uh, prying eyes having a look at the data that's being sent across the wire. Uh, so you would get these certificate authorities to actually do enterprise level uh, issuing of certificates, uh, and that would be used to kind of encrypt data between whoever's using the browser and the server, knowing that there's not a man in the middle actually intercepting that data. And that's really where we started seeing the first form of uh, public key cryptography being used on the internet. Uh, and th that has now taken off in a big way. Uh, where it's very rare you'll visit a website that's not HTTPS enabled. Uh, but even, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the internet itself is a TCP IP network that is coordinated by a group called ICANN. 
I can pretty much maintain uh, this instance of it. And it just happens to be the TCP network that most of us are tethered to today and call the internet. And within that infrastructure, uh, you pretty much also have these um, certificate authorities uh, that are also coordinated through ICANN for the actual issuing of these certificates. So it's pretty much a controlled environment, uh, but that, that's pretty much where we've seen the network effect. Uh, and Web2 is the evolution of those three pillars I mentioned earlier and the coordination of that through the W3C and participating vendors. So I'll mention a couple things. One, as we speak, you're reminding me that um, anyone who has deeper interest in this phase of the web might want to check out the interview I did with Austin Hill. Um, Austin Hill was formerly the CEO at Blockstream when they first started, but he also had some really cool com companies back in the, I believe, 90s and 2000s, um, where he was trying to pioneer using cryptography for communications and doing and, and, and providing like internet services to connect people to the internet and various, you know, products for doing things, you know, all in this vein of having more privacy and more security and, you know, other details. So I would say it's a really good interview. It's a really good like snapshot into the history of the web and cryptography in the early days and then transitioning into like the early days of Bitcoin companies with Blockstream. So check that out if you guys are interested. It's at um, the website's uh, thebiz.pro if you want to listen to that. And then I'll mention, um, <clears throat> you know, as we talk about Web2, I guess we should start to talk about what maybe the, the narrative is about the problems of Web2 and what kind of things people kind of complain about and why people try to invent more versions of the web, you know, going from Web3 to 5 and, you know, peer-to-peer -peer web, etc. So as you have this read and write web and you have all this interoperability of how we're rendering this, this content, um, there was not much interoperation between the websites themselves and the user having some sort of portability for their identity or their accounts or their data. And so what you, you, we ended up with is this kind of really severe walled garden culture. And so you have it where Every time a website would become really popular and you know really successful as a business, they would begin locking down their APIs, which are you know ways that you know application interfaces where people could interface the data about their uh, their accounts and kind of this would allow for interoperation. But you would find that like when Twitter had something like say TweetDeck become really popular. Um, Sorry, my watch is making noise. <laughs> uh, they would start locking down IPIs or just buy the company outright. And so this walled garden thing mutated to be so severe where you ended up with like, you know, in, in China, you have WeChat. Well, everything happens within this walled garden. Payments, social media, chat, everything. And you wanted Facebook, you know, they, they wanted to do very similar things. And this is why you saw them try to do things like they bought um, WhatsApp and Instagram. And then they wanted to do their own like uh, stable coin kind of thing a couple of years ago that, that gloriously failed. And they just wanted to recreate this kind of walled garden WeChat experience. And so we're left with this web and Internet where... Anytime you create something of value as an, as an identity, as an account, it ends up being locked in with the peer that you created it with. And you don't have a lot of practical ways to pull it out or migrate to other services if you are no longer happy with that service. If you get banned from Twitter or are sick of the rules on Twitter, you can't just take all your followers with you and render them somewhere else. If you get tired of Facebook or, or Medium, there's not a very easy way to just export things and re-import them elsewhere, despite all the efforts made to make data interoperable and rendered you know, uh, consistently. These things are kind of, the, the incentives aren't there for these websites because they want to keep you there and they want to make money off of you and keep you as a user and they need the headcount. So this is why you get people wanting to do, you know, future forms of the web and more interoperable and freer forms because you want this kind of ability to migrate, this ability to kind of leave, this ability to be uncensorable. Um, there are other reasons as well that we can get into, but yeah, I, I think that um, that covers most of Web 2 and, and that up to this point.
Um, can I can I add something here? Yes, uh, please, sir. Yeah, I love I love the uh, the diversity of opinions here, and I always love to hear about the history of the web from blockchain. It's amazing. Uh, but I also I think there is a step that was missed here because I remember the first time I got on the internet. I think it was you know I'm I'm sure it was before Google, and I was very young and. I opened the web browser and I didn't know what to do there. <laughs> like, I just it has an address bar. That's that's great, but then what? So I actually called uh, my relatives who were um, who were had internet before me, and I literally on the phone got a list of all the web pages that might be interesting uh, to visit because that's the only way to find anything on the internet. And I visited all those web pages and I read them all. And uh, in one day, everything that I can read, I can reach, I just read and there was nothing else to do. And while I'm listening to Brookshank uh, explain web one, I uh, obviously we, we have to acknowledge that one of the reasons web two uh, came by is because we we needed um, a centralized uh, services that offer discoverability and search engines and stuff like that and enable people to create content without having uh, the knowledge to, to create web servers and maintain web servers etc but I also had had to think while listening to that is why couldn't I? Uh, discover websites that my friends and contacts created. So I knew the phone numbers of my relatives. That's how I contacted them and asked them about websites that they know. But why couldn't they, why couldn't they, these phone numbers be the uh, actual addresses that I can go visit and suddenly I can read the data that they created from their computers um, and I think that's uh, that's one of the things that we need to think about as we are building something new because whatever whatever new things we are going to build it will suffer from the same problems it will need uh, aggregators and search engines and discoverability uh, but if we if we get identity right and if we get and if we think about the web from a subjective point of view, from a contact book point of view, then that problem will get a little bit uh, easier because suddenly when you visit this new web, you at least have something to bootstrap with, which is your contacts, your network, and you can read their stuff immediately. And if you think about it, most of the content on the new web, on the web too, is is stuff that are not reachable by search engines, but are stuff that are created and shared between people on their um, messenger and WhatsApp and Signal and chat apps like that. Um, so I think that it's very valuable to think about the whatever new web we create from the point of view of networking and uh, subjectivity. And the question is how to make it very easy and very convenient for people to create content without uh, going through the hassle of setting up a web server and getting a certificate and a domain name and rent that domain name and then lose it once you, once they forget about it for a year, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's what I was thinking about listening to all of that. Yeah, I'll maybe extend on that one. Obviously, talking about Web 1 and Web 2 in, just in terms of standards, uh, something you've touched on, which I think kind of like started showing some of the areas that wasn't necessarily thought of the direction the web would go, was the discovery of content online. And uh, I think for anyone who used the web back then, you kind of had uh, AltaVista was one of the, the more prolific search engines at the time. But even predating them, you had like uh, Yahoo, who would create online directory services, mostly for categorizing content. Uh, so you wouldn't typically search for something 
uh, but you would use kind of like online lookup directory to be able to get to content. And, and this obviously was to serve that issue that you were having, but it was kind of like a word of mouth thing. And uh, the balkanization really started there with these vendors starting becoming funnels or gateways for people to be able to access the internet uh, or the web. Uh, not the internet, sorry. Um, and, and I think uh, like like one of the good examples in the States might have been uh, AOL, who would provide internet access, a kind of like branded OEM version of Internet Explorer, I believe it was at the time, that's kind of branded with AOL stuff. But it would also have the default homepage to be AOL's website. Uh, and there was kind of a battle happening for people to have the go-to directory service. Uh, and then AltaVista and those ones came around, which made search uh, a lot easier uh, for people to not have to actually host their own infrastructure. You had the likes of GeoCities coming about. GeoCities allowed you just to like put together a simple website and host it. And it's one of the tr internet treasure troves or web treasure troves that we know of that, that kind of uh, dissipated after a while. There's a lot of information that was lost in that. Uh, but during that, the advent of Google uh, also came along, which obviously obsoleted a lot of these other search engines and directories due to their page uh, rank algorithm that they were using in the background. Uh, but now we started seeing users uh, kind of, instead of being incentivized to host your own HTTP server, because the technology, let's face it, it is distributed by design, Everyone is really encouraged in its design to host their own HTTP site, uh, but, but it starts becoming a bit impractical in scaling that when you start w uh, wanting to look for information. Uh, so now you have these corporations that provide these services, and they essentially would actually scale that out to be able to deal with the demand because we, we started really seeing uh, the web's version of the attention economy. And that is where you've got to attract a lot of attention to the services you provide, but that has its cons in it because now you start with tracking and privacy concerns uh, as well as uh, dictating and having a bit more weight in establishing what these next specs and standards might be because you just get that network effect. And we, we saw the similar thing with the internet browsers. Uh, Microsoft, I think, was even part of the antitrust lawsuits uh, because their operating system, Windows at the time, uh, also would promote Internet Explorer. So you had this concern that one software vendor uh, controlled all that attention, and because they ran the web browser, uh, the idea was that Microsoft is actually trying to own the web as well. Uh, but fortunately in the proprietary versus free and open software movement, we saw the, the coming of age of uh, like the Mozilla side on the Netscape side, subsequently Mozilla, um, and people just started favoring a lot of these uh, alternatives. But we, we still saw a balkanization and it's even just gotten worse to today uh, through search engines, social media networks, et cetera, which, which I guess gets us to uh, the web three portion that we'll speak to. I'm curious to, to ask a question. You mentioned that the first um, the resource identifiers were called the UDI, uh, Universal Document Identifier. Do, are you familiar of any uh, early attempts to make um, like something that you can call human identifiers or a way to make contacts on the internet at the base layer? Or wasn't that thought of at all? Like, did anyone think of using phone numbers, for example, on the internet, something like that? Yeah, not, nothing coming to mind. I, I would definitely say, um, and I'll touch on the Web3 thing a bit. As recent uh, as just a couple of years ago, um, I mean, they, they've been... These proposals from the W3C, uh, I think, to, to actually identify that, that identity has become an issue that is being gatekept and held by a lot of these vendors. So that's only really something I've seen within the last couple of years become a thing, but uh, definitely not to my recollection has been something that was part of the initial design of the web. 
I'm going to guess that IP addresses and email were solving a, a, a spectrum, a portion of the spectrum there. And so maybe it wasn't addressed, but I'm just speculating. I, I know there was obviously the ability to have, you know, uh, a way to email people and a way to find a server through an IP at some stage. But I don't really know too much about the details, so I, I won't wax any more on that. Um, Alex, uh, sorry, uh, R, you made me think of... Um, that uh, I definitely agree that um, that having ways to find data and not you know uh, not having to rely on a central aggregator is part of the problem why we ended up with a web two that we're not necessarily totally happy with and this wall you know led to these walled garden phenomena and so I, I do think that obviously we agree because we are working on the same projects but um, I do think it is an important thing to try to think about how to have subjectivity within the design and so that way you can be able to find things that are more related to you I guess relativity as well um, and to be able to kind of bootstrap your own sort of personal view of the web and then uh, grokchain you mentioned you know a couple of things I thought of as well I'll try to be quick but you know there's the other problems that people have with the web too are that I didn't mention earlier is the kind of dynamic between the ad subsidized web of advertising and the privacy that leakage of you know your personal data that comes with that and so basically monetizing the user in order to have many of the websites be free and many of the services not be monetized and kind of have this this removal of friction so then the user ends up getting you know, being the product and monetize, and thus all of their data gets tracked and all the data is collected and aggregated. And this is all happening in the background without users knowing too much about what's going on and not actually being involved in any of the profits either. They're just basically getting to use most of the web for free. Um, and so that's another thing that some people are motivated to kind of fix with Web2 beyond what we've discussed so far is to give users more control of the data they share um, when they share it, whether they share it, who they share it with, et cetera. And, and also to give them, you know, options to more uh, intentionally decide whether they would prefer to pay for something than leak data, whether they would prefer to have the ability to, you know, monetize their content themselves. And so monetization of content and, you know, control of your own data, at least control of when you disseminate the data into who, are, are other things that probably a lot of people are wanting to address with Web 3, 4, 5, etc. Yeah, I think, um, well, uh, another important thing that happened, but it's more like a, a pattern, like I was mentioning now with GeoCities becoming like the central point for people to host content. Uh, Google, etc., becoming the central points for finding content. Uh, it's a matter of convenience because uh, we pretty much then saw the coming of age of cloud-based computing, like through Amazon Web Services, Azure. And uh, if you had worked for corporate back in the 90s, one of your big challenges, the, the first was, is if you're going to host infrastructure, you typically have a data center at the corporation you were working with. Uh, you would then sit with like an intranet, which is typically the company's own managed IP network, and they might not expose that onto the internet for confidentiality reasons or just to have control over their own wall garden and knowledge base, et cetera, and their databases. And then they might expose a version of that out onto the web, which was called the extranet. And that was the portion through which you typically have a net, a part of your network segmented in even what they called a, a demilitarized zone. Uh, where you would expose your internet-facing uh, services like your corporate website uh, or your e-commerce uh, site, etc. Uh, but the overhead in actually having the skills in-house to manage that was obviously a concern for the company because it, it might not have been its primary objective at the time. And then also imagine having to serve an influx of users to these websites on like a dial-up modem. Um, so it, it just became very impractical for you to do that. And when these cloud services, et cetera, well, before the cloud services happened, you, you might approach one of your, your local telecom companies uh, and you might co-host or co-locate a server on their premises. They'd have data centers where you can go and put down a box and they would actually take care of the infrastructure management. 
there might be a VPN configured to that box that you have to your local corporate network that you can manage. Um, but still, the maintenance would need to be actually funded by the corporation. And if you start having a look at an individual wanting to do that, um, one of the issues I know here in South Africa, I'm not too familiar with how it was abroad, but your ISP would typically issue you an IP to be able to access the internet. And within the IPv4 or TCP IP stack, like the, the con conventional IPv4 uh, spec, you pretty much are limited to four and a quarter billion addresses worldwide. That, that's pretty much what everyone gets allocated to access the, the internet today. Um, so if you, uh, when you wanted to host a website, you could only host one website on an IP address. Uh, and that's where IPv6 as a spec actually became quite an important thing to push because we could extend that address space quite significantly. But one modification was made to HTTP 1 at the time, uh, which subsequently became HTTP 1.1. And that was able to add like this host entry into the HTTP protocol that would allow you to actually host multiple websites on one IP. So there was a scalability concern at the time, but a lot of this technical stuff had to be taken care of by the individuals working at like these corporates or et cetera. And uh, eventually, a, a lot of the telecoms, uh, the AWSs, et cetera, of the world realized that this is a pain that everyone is having to endure because Amazon themselves, like AWS, came as a product offering out of their internal struggles with actually managing infrastructure and keeping Amazon's like retail website online. And they figured because this is such a prolific problem everyone's having, uh, what if they abstract it into a product suite and then sell that onto corporates? And because that just became so attractive, uh, you, you eventually started seeing the balkanization and people getting attracted to adopting that level of centralization uh, for convenience. Um, so it, it's kind of irrespective of where you touch this thing from which facet, it's always a convenience factor that draws us towards the centralization. Because like I say, the, the web itself is actually decentralized or distributed in nature. Nothing prevents you from hosting your own web server. The question comes into, can you uh, actually manage the traffic? And then, yeah, the, the point I had on, on South Africa was we would be assigned a dynamic address every time we connected to the internet. So whenever you had the translation from a friendly name like uh, grokchain.co.za, I would have to constantly change the record to point to the new IP address of the IP I get assigned by my ISP. Uh, if you wanted a more enterprise level connection because of that four and a quarter billion address like allocation, uh, it is quite a scarce resource on the ICANN network. Um, you, you'd have to pay premium dollar to actually get a static IP through which you can then have this fixed label point to it. And that's also something that a lot of these other providers have, have just simplified for us along the way. And because they can purchase it at bulk, uh, you as an individual don't necessarily get caught up in, in the costs associated with uh, that, that rare like digital real estate. A few more things you're making me think of. Um, so yeah, I think it's a very good point, very important point that you know you're going to hear a lot of people in the next couple of years talk about you know making a decentralized Twitter or decentralizing the web. And it is important to remember that you know at the base it already is decentralized as a protocol, and that like as Grokchain mentions, you're not going to be if you have. 500,000 followers or you follow 5,000 people, you're not typically going to be able to run that and process all of that in a way that your users would be happy with or your computer can handle. And so you do still always need you know, uh, the convenience of centralization in order to scale things in the web and in any network. And so the question becomes going back to like this interoperability concept and this kind of local first concept where you start the data and you generate it locally and you choose how to disseminate it. 
the the data model and the kind of infrastructure that's, that has to be in place is not quite as uh, obvious as it might seem to a normal user. You still basically have to do a lot of the same things that we do today. You just have to do them more intentionally from a local first perspective and kind of having a way of maintaining data integrity when other people are serving it for you for scaling purposes. And so the kind of next web would probably have to be something where you are creating data locally first, and that data is kind of signed by your key and thus, you know, locked by you, and then it can be served by other people in a way that they can show and, and prove for themselves by looking at the root data that it was created by your key and is authentic. Um, this is a good segue to mention a couple other web things of these times that we that we missed, which is Napster, BitTorrent, and Tor. Um, I don't want I don't want to take all day with this this podcast, but um, I think these are relevant things just to mention at least. Which is Napster came along when people started using MP3s and WMA files and you know basically digital music, and it gave people a granted centralized way to kind of peer to peer file share. Um, and this was kind of like a, a whole big, huge thing back then. And, you know, uh, lots of people were very upset, like music companies and everybody wanted to get it shut down. And it was like a, a really big news and, and event in the Internet. Um, and I don't remember, forgive me if I get the order wrong here, but somewhere around then also we, uh, we got BitTorrent as an answer of a way to do similar, you know, outcomes to be able to do peer to peer file sharing without having to trust a centralized provider. And so BitTorrent and is a whole other technology that will become relevant as, you know, we talk about other things that lead to the next web, um, and then I guess if you want to, Grokchain or R, maybe you can talk a little bit about Tor as well. Well, may, maybe before I get on to that one, I think it, we, we've obviously covered a lot of innovation happening uh, within kind of like the tech side here. Uh, but an important one that you brought up is Napster as an example. And I think following the Napster incident, we started really, well, well even prior to Napster, uh, I recall there was an, an issue. I don't remember the exact date, um, but I believe it was a French, the French government, I think it was, uh, that contacted Yahoo in California uh, once upon a time, asking them why it is that their citizens are being provided with a way to purchase Nazi memorabilia. And this was kind of like the awareness then that nationalization has created these borders, but the internet itself does not have these borders. And uh, for, for the company in in California, they would be like, uh, our regulations don't apply, your, your regulations don't apply here. So what we provide on the website is kind of like what we provide and, and regulators have subsequently introduced uh, regs to kind of like, uh, put things in place that would get vendors in various countries to agree to limit that kind of content as an example. Uh, but something that came out of the Napster side was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And that was uh, pretty much uh, a lot of weight was put behind that from the recording industry at the time as a way to curb uh, piracy as an example. So I think there's also like this regulatory legal aspect of it that was trailing along that started introducing things that, that would actually put these, let's say, pseudo borders uh, onto the web. And I think more advanced versions of that you see today is like the European uh, GDRP or GDPR. I don't know exactly. It was the, the, the Data Protection Act. But, but that's pretty much um, trying to also add regulatory requirements for uh, anyone who is on the web to kind of like protect user data. It's kind of just taking this wild west of what we call the web and then introducing like these regulatory boundaries to kind of like help help with that. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, th th that, that part of it also started coming into play. Well, then I just did a quick summary of Tor. It's, it's basically what people refer to as like the dark web and it's just an alternative way of forming a website network that doesn't use the same, you know, ICANN domain name registration aspect, and it uses a sort of more encrypted routing method for contacting peers and serving websites. 
And this is where, you know, things like Silk Road lived and similar websites since then. But I'm not an expert in this, so I don't really want to talk too much about it. It's just worth noting that, that we have already had alternative webs. I just want to say that uh, that just like Gokshen said, whatever like whatever web you are going to create again, if you start from scratch, you will you will also get to the point where you need uh, the convenience of uh, a big company running and hosting your data for availability. You will need search engines. You will need all that infrastructure for scale. So I don't think that uh, the failure and, and Web 2.0 is about centralization per se, uh, but it's more about that there is no identity that you control on your own. Uh, because even if even if you run a server on your home, just like Grokhan said, most people will not have a static IP in the first place. But even if they have uh, and they just travel to another place, then that IP will change and you you will have to eventually rent a DNS and that can be blocked, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have a way to have uh, uh, an identity that you own, uh, regardless of what anyone thinks, then gatekeeping and centralization uh, and the problems that comes from, the, from centralization are much less than what people think. So in my opinion, if, if the internet had identity just baked in it, most of the problems of Web 2.0 would just disappear. So the question is, can we, can we create that and uh, just enjoy everything else that we learned about how to scale uh, discover, discoverability and hosting, et cetera? So I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to keep, to get back to identity every now and then. Uh, because that's what I'm working on and passionate about. So, yeah. Yeah, before we jump into identity, let's uh, move first uh, to Web3. Okay. So what was your first impression of Web3? And uh, how did things kind of turn out? Kind of like w when you first heard the term Web3, Web what, what did go through your mind? And how did it turn into a web of lies? Maybe we'd start with John. So the first time I heard Web3 was not the original Web3. The first time I did hear of Web3 was from Ethereum shitcoiners. Um, admittedly, I, I should have heard of other versions of Web3 beforehand, but I had not just yet. Very soon after I did. But the first time I heard of it, it was through... Um, Gavin Wood and their, I forget what it's called, Web3 Foundation or something. And it was pretty early. Like It may have even been like when ICOs were big. It was not the current trend with how shitcoins are talking about Web3. It was a little bit earlier than that where they started this. And for some reason, the narrative is more strong now than it was then. I guess, you know, they, they try a lot of narratives and a lot of things, a lot of trends. And this one didn't quite get traction the first time around. And so I just basically ignored it. Um, but then as I wanted to work on the, the kind of vision for Synonym and this atomic economy concept that we kind of later came up with to describe you know, this whole vision and, and combining fixing the web with Bitcoin, um, I did end up researching more about the web and its history and learning about what kind of the earlier you know, ideas of what Web3 was. And this mostly my main interest was in concepts around the semantic web, which again is Tim Berners-Lee, uh, a Tim Berners-Lee related topic. And this was just basically a way, you know, he had standardized a lot of things about the web um, in the early days, but one kind of unsolved problem that remains unsolved today is just how to have like metadata about the data. And there are different ways to have semantics about data, about endpoints, about entities, so you could more easily find them. And this kind of was compensated, you know, a lot by Google taking over and, you know, having great algorithms starting with PageRank and now getting much more complicated and you know websites having to do SEO to be able to be found within Google's search engine but this is all extremely centralized and controlled and not very private and you know very dystopian if it falls into the wrong you know path um, 
so yeah, the, 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 the original Web3, as far as I know, and there maybe is even more, blockchain can probably elaborate more. I think there was other you know, terms used for the Web3, but before shitcoiners kind of co-opted it, was about the semantic web and having ways to basically you know, create, to make it easier to categorize data and you know, to have types of data and metadata about the content on the web. Um, but then, <clears throat> I guess shitcoins started to kind of associate this concept of, you know, everything that was cool about the web was now something that you could do on a blockchain. And everything that was cool about finance was something that you could do at a blockchain. So, you know, we had ICOs and then this kind of transitioned, you know, more recently to NFTs. And NFTs were kind of like this combination between an ICO um, oh, I skipped over DeFi, sorry, but, you know, who cares? Um, it's not really relevant at the moment. Um, but the NFTs were kind of a way of being in between a token and a, a token scams and Ponzi schemes and in between, like, identity and having, you know, key pairs represent some sort of endpoint. But with NFTs, they kind of did it wrong, um, in my opinion, at least, where they kind of... An NFT is just basically like an autograph about data somewhere, but there's not any actual atomic connection between this, you know, this signed data and the actual data itself. There's not any enforceable contracts. There's not any enforceable copyrights or trademarks. There's not even any enforceable, you know, ability to know that the data will be there when you go look for it. And so shitcoins have tried to kind of co-opt the web three original web three concept totally throw it out the window it has nothing to do with semantics and kind of just make it about a url to data on some other data system typically ipfs and and, and shitcoin examples um but there again is no actual atomic connection there's no search engine or method of finding these things everything that they're doing with like OpenSea, etc these are all very just centralized websites for indexing things and now they're trying to kind of go further with it and more towards what, you know, the use cases like we're trying to solve with slash tags and by combining it with Hypercore and what uh, TBD is trying to do with Web5 and combining, you know, ION and very similar concepts to what we're doing with slash tags and Hypercore. Um, they're trying to put these things on the blockchain again. And they're trying to say that NFTs will be great, you know, way, a, a great format for identities and accounts and a great format for data and all of these things. But they're just repeatedly trying to inject, you know, these, these web use cases into a Ponzi scheme, into something that can be sold and, you know, create liquidity for the companies that are providing it. And so I know that's a little bit of a rant, but, you know, that my, my first impressions were just, you know, I ignored Web3 and at first because it just nobody cared. And I was like, I can't be, whatever they're trying to do is probably bullshit. So I ignored it. Then I ended up learning a little bit more about, you know, the semantic web and concepts there. And then now, you know, the, the shit coins are really trying to get deep into Web3 and, and, and defining it themselves. But essentially what all it means right now is interfaces for token contracts and NFTs. And neither of those things, I think, actually address the problems in a very intentional way, like the way companies like ours are, uh, are, ours is trying to do, as well as companies like TBD and others. There are actually you know, decades of uh, work put into research and development for various aspects of these problems. But I think we're all converging now on very similar designs and realizing that the proper way that this really has to be done with, you know, the, the, the technology that we have possible. And that all comes from, as R mentioned, this primitive of using public key pairs, public-private key pairs to represent everything. Um, we named slash tags slash tags not, not because... Um, well, specifically because we didn't want to call it something ID, because I always felt that if we wanted to properly respect things like trying to solve the semantic web and anchoring things to keys, that ID and identity is not a compelling narrative for users, despite it being 
one of the main use cases for using key pairs. Um, I do think that, you know, as we talk about our design more, that there are, it just represents some sort of endpoint and some sort of way to attach metadata to, to anchor it to something. And that's the, the kind of running theme with slash, ta slash tags is that these are keys that you can tag. And so that's, that's kind of my uh, overview of Web3 and a little bit of contrasting it to, you know, maybe the proper ways to do it. But I defer to uh, Grokchain on, you know, maybe other definitions of Web3 and maybe going a little deeper on the semantic web stuff. Also, I'd, I'd love to hear from Grokchain, when was the first time you heard the word Web3 and what did Goal3 add on top of what, what John kind of said? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, the Web 1, Web 2, th those were really terms being put out by the World uh, Wide Web Consortium. And it was the first, well, yeah, my interpretation was quite different because Web 3 was actually officially announced through a presentation given at the W3C as early as January 2006. And the idea there was that with the coming of age of uh, kind of like the interlinked web services architecture that was occurring uh, and Google's page rank being quite prolific is that a lot of people, if you have a look at HTML itself, the markup language consists of a handful of tags you get to express content. Uh, and that would typically revolve around kind of like the the presentation. So you've got things like headings and paragraphs and divisions and lists and ordered lists and these things. Uh, but something that was lacking at the time was kind of a metadata layer to be able to make more programmatic assertions about things. Uh, so uh, a technology that, that uh, was quite prolific at the time was something called XML. It is the subset of HTML. HTML kind of like being the upper side of things out of which HTML is, is kind of like a subspec. XML allowed people to define their own vocabulary of tags. So let's say I wrote a document about the quick brown fox jumping over the fence and I wanted to emphasize that the fox and the fence were, were something meaningful in that sentence, I would typically either wrap that with like a bold tag or an emphasis tag. Uh, but for anything that had to interpret that document and could not really distinguish or determine why it is that you were emphasizing something in the document. Uh, so the idea was that if we add a semantic flavor to that, meaning we can rather use tags that define meaning to what we were doing, that we could write programs to actually interpret these documents and then use the styling to represent a difference. So using the same sentence, the quick brown fox, I could actually put a tag around brown saying that it was a color. I could put a tag around fox saying that it was an animal and I could put it around fence saying that it's some form of object. And then I could also start defining kind of like these uh, ontologies for expressing what the relationship between these things are. And you ended up with like the concept of the resource description framework was one initiative being pushed forward by the W3C. And you also had a, a separate working group that was working on something called topic maps. And the concept there was you would deal with any, any content you were busy developing would be a, a topic uh, it would have associations between these topics, and then there would be occurrences of these topics on the web. So I could actually develop this metadata framework, uh, and then you'd write search engines to rather interpret the metadata layer to make more viable like assertions uh, instead of indexing the content itself. Uh, but the tech at the time, I mean, it was very complicated to work with. It's actually interesting. I think one of the slides uh, had a section on crypto, which, as we know today, uh, requires some disambiguation. And a simple example I use is whenever you go to a friend's house today, uh, they might ask you might ask them for the Wi-Fi password. And we know what that means is the user would like access to the Internet. But any technical person would know that by having access to Wi-Fi, you pretty much just get access to the local area, like the TCP network of the individual uh, on which the router or the Wi-Fi access point has been exposed. And assuming typically there is an internet gateway on that network, you'll be able to connect to the Wi-Fi network and have this breakout point onto the internet. Um, 
Now, in a very similar way, that presentation that was given by the World Wide Web Consortium had a section on crypto, but crypto in terms of cryptography, which is essentially, I mean, th th that's kind of like what it's referred to. And uh, getting to the later point, like John says, uh, with um, the guys, it's kind of like the co-opting of the brand occurred around about 2014, 2015, uh, by the likes of like the the Web3 Foundation to kind of like get the direction or attention of a lot of individuals in this hype, uh, which was almost like a decade later, to get focused on the projects that they were working on, which pretty much had nothing to do with content, uh, but more to do with this advent of digital scarcity. Uh, but the original Web3 to me is what is called the semantic web. It has got nothing to do with what people refer to it as today. But unfortunately, it's become synonymous with the Wi-Fi example. People uh, have associated it to something completely different. All right. Um, so is there actually kind of, we talked about Web3, is there Web3? Four that we can talk about, or or do you think kind of concepts like the semantic web or the Internet of Things, how some people call Web four, are kind of dead and never succeeded? Uh, maybe with blockchain, you want to take that? Yeah, like like I say, man, the 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 labels themselves, I think are are, are mainly like I say from a W three C's perspective. It's kind of like marketing just to define these various milestones in the evolution of the web, but they don't really specify anything in particular. It's kind of a, a moving target or an overt window of, of the web's capability at a certain point in time. Um, as far as like Web 4, Web 5, like unless it comes from the W3C, I typically kind of ignore it. Uh, but I haven't really seen them mention anything about Web 4, if I can call it that. Uh, and I think the latest has been Web 5, more from, I think it's Spiral, correct me if I'm wrong, John. Uh, but I think that's also just a tongue-in-cheek way of actually taking advantage of this narrative where people are using increments of web versions uh, to draw attention to something that they're doing, because that just seems to be, it's more of a marketing thing. Yeah, I would say, to my knowledge, there is no Web 4, and the, the jump kind of was by web five you know i i can't speak for them but i would just say they they wanted to kind of play a little bit off of the concept of naming like when web when ethereum used web three and kind of tried to co-opt it that what they were basically doing was taking advantage of this convention they're saying okay people have you know dealt with html4 html5 then they have web one web two and this, these kind of things became accepted and they kind of laid the groundwork early for co-opting web three so it became very easy for them to just kind of define their web and their you know product ecosystem as the next web in an authoritative way by naming it web three and this is just kind of it's it's a it's a gimmick it's a narrative it's a trick um and so i think that what tbd is doing not they're not spiral they're tbd by the way grok chain um you know but they are kind of sister entities or projects or companies i'm not sure the technicals behind it but they are all coming from block um but tbd is focused on this work and i and you know them naming their ecosystem and their kind of design for the next web um is 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 not scammy in the same way that web3 is but it is kind of a similar trick it's basically using this naming convention but in a tongue in cheek kind of way against the 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 co-opted web3 to say we're just going to skip all we're going to skip web4 and we're web5 and if we're going to play this numbering game we're going to be even bigger number you know um i'm sure they had more thinking in different ways that they would put it but that's the impression you know for myself and probably for other people that they're just trying to like literally one up web3 um and, and skip a whole version and say we're beyond web3 but in the end, none of these things are actual, you know, standards and actual, you know, uh, specs that are, you know, 
common and accepted by the majority, their proposals and their proposals for either new webs or new ecosystems or, you know, add or additional features for the current ones. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that there is no official web three or, or, or that has actually gone anywhere. And it's certainly not the web three as defined by shitcoiners. And there's no official web four or web five either. These are just kind of proposals for new, you know, uh, stacks of, of technology. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, mostly a marketing play. But if we already talk about Web five, and John touched on it already, um, let's 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 talk about what TBD is doing. And uh, so Jack Dorsey promoted a new Web five narrative for his project called TBD. Can you explain a little bit more what Web five is simply for Bitcoiners? And again, kind of, I think Web five is more a marketing term. It's nothing that's kind of special to TBD in itself. It's just kind of like rejecting the VC-driven uh, Web3 model. Maybe R, you can take that one first. And I know we have a lot of questions and people raise their hands. Um, we will get to you guys after we finish the questions. Um, so if you want to kind of like withdraw your questions right now, we'll get to you later. Um, R, do you want to take that one? Can I explain kind of like Web5, what does it mean for Bitcoin or so? Maybe don't call it Web5. What, what is the new web? Yeah, I just want to point out uh, that uh, if something is from W3C or any other standard uh, body, doesn't make it any uh, any official or any more uh, like uh, any more reliable or possible to take off or get them adopted because as you as you listened the w, the, the web 3.0 the semantic web really didn't go anywhere so it's it's not about who who puts out the idea or makes the standard it's whether or not the wider uh community of developers adopts uh, the standards and if even there is no standard but people started building stuff and it goes out that's that's what matters but uh, coming to the Web5, um, I just want to remind you about what I said in the beginning about the idea of going on on Web1 for the first time and uh, struggling through the facts that you don't have an identity layer uh, on the internet that allows you to go look up for data that is created by the people that you already know, but by their phone numbers or any other um, identifier outside of the internet. So I think that if, if you talk about Web5 or whatever uh, new new web that uh, all the all the initiatives in the space are trying to do, I think there is two distinct and important uh, solutions that we are all uh, trying to build, and none of them are new or anything. People have been thinking and building and designing uh, in those two distinct areas for quite some time. So on one hand, you have the, the question of how do you address human beings uh, and other uh, entities like companies and even um, devices? How do you address these stuff that are outside of content, outside of document, outside of uh, um just uh, static objects how do you how do you give entities agents how do you give them urls how do you give them identifiers that that it can be used later for reaching these people contacting them uh attaching metadata about them saying something about them and how to make those identifiers last for a long time and if you think about it, we, we really don't have on the internet anything that comes close even to phone numbers. Uh, like even phone numbers are not perfect, but we don't even have anything that is similar to phone numbers. Um, so how do we how do we have that? And uh, <clears throat> I can talk about all the different ways that people are trying to solve that, but I'm just trying to to categorize these two areas first the identity layer and the second area is how do you create 
data local first? How do you create data on your device first and then think about how to share it and optimize and scale its delivery to the wider world? But how to make the creation story local first? So just think about local first, uh, data authoring and data sharing and identity layers. So those are the two main topics that what Web5 or uh, any, any uh, similar initiative is trying to achieve. Um, I don't want to just rant uh, for, for long without just getting more questions just to, to figure out what are people thinking and, uh, and what, the, what the context that, that they are missing. Um, so maybe you can ask me a few questions about these uh, two topics. But first of all, the, the only way to, to give people identity on the web that we can think of is just using key pairs. And if you use a key pair to, where the private key is used to author data and the public key is used to discover the data, then you start, you start solving the identity layer, but in my opinion, it, it's not as useful until you have applications and uh, application layer and data layer that support these uh, these key pairs. Luckily, uh, there's the DHT, the distributed hash table that allow for the first time uh, people to run servers on their home network on their laptop these servers can be addressed and reached using the public key. So that's something that I'm very excited about because it's very unlike uh, a domain name system. You can just create a new key pair and announce that on the DHT and suddenly you can be reachable using that uh, key pair. And that, that itself really puts a value to your keys because it suddenly becomes a, a destination that people can contact you on. But but they can also but they can but using also other primitives like hypercores, which is think about it as a blockchain that only you edit and doesn't have a consensus layer or anything. It just people just trust you to edit it. Then using the distributed hash table and the this hypercore primitive, you can, uh, other peers other than you can share the same data that is addressed by your public key, even if you are offline. Th this is what, what gives you, what gives the key pair really its, its value because I can, I can ask questions to my network about a specific public key and find the metadata that it, it, it attached to it. So I can reach to my D, my distributed hash table and ask who has the public uh, hypercore or the public data, public metadata that is attached to a specific key pair. And then even if the creator of that data is not online, my peers can share these data with me. And now I can find up-to-date data that is authored by that creator. Uh, Without without them being online, without having domain name system, without any of that, so that's a really powerful uh, primitive. But it's also it's also allowing you to create data local first. So when you start thinking about uh, scalability, when you start thinking about scalability, now scalability is is not who runs uh, Facebook or who runs Twitter and how do I sign into Facebook and Twitter and create the data in Facebook or in Twitter with their own schema, with their own data types, with their own API. Scalability will become who gets to build the, the, the best scaler for hosting these primitives. So I edit the primitives themselves on my own device and then scalability becomes a layer on top. It doesn't, it, it's not something that I have to buy in from the ground on. So if I don't like this service provider that is keeping my data uh, public and keeping my data available 
and keeping my data available 24 seven and uh, hosting it for a, a bigger scale, I can just put my data in another service, service provider. And because my data is addressed using my public key, all my followers, all my friends, all my contacts will find this same data using my public key. And suddenly you, you don't have any lock in, you don't have gatekeeping, you don't have censorship because it doesn't matter if you stop seeding my data if you, if, 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 as a company, as long as people can discover where the new place where I'm seeding the data in. Um, obviously there are other uh, primitives that uh, that can be layered on top of that to create what eventually we want in Synonym to build, which is the uh, web self trust. Uh, these these primitives are stuff like how to create an attestation, how to 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 say something about someone, to start building uh, uh, reputation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, I don't want to speak much about what Web5 uh, and TBD are doing, but they are basically building uh, primitives on those three, uh, three spaces. I, the identity layer, um, the content uh, shit, authoring and sharing in a decentralized way, and the, what the, the solution for attestations, which I believe is called verifiable credentials. Um, I, I took so long, so I, I, will, I will wait for any more questions about any of these parts. Yeah, our, uh, I might just want to expand on that one. I think your, your phone number analogy is quite an interesting one, because uh, just to draw analogies between what we know as a phone directory today versus the internet, the internet being a public IP network managed or coordinated through ICANN with the 4 billion odd uh, IPv4 addresses that are allocated through ISPs, etc., to you, the end user, is obviously coordinated and it is quite permissioned. Anyone on this call today at least had to ask for permission from their ISP to obtain one of those to be able to access the ICANN network. Uh, but because there are so many options, you can typically circumvent that one of the ISPs is going to let you on there. Uh, but we have a very similar pattern that happened within the phone numbers as well, right? Uh, because you've got like, uh, what is it, uh, NAMP, which is the North American numbering plan, as an example, is there is an authority that kind of coordinates the allocation of uh, the space of numbers for actual, uh, like that addressing portion. So if we distinguish that the network allocation is obviously one area that needs to be have a, had a look at, uh, the domain name system is kind of a layer on top of that uh, on the internet side for uh, translating those names into numbers. And the irony of it is that with the advent of certificate authorities, most websites actually do use public key encryption uh, to serve data over the web and can be found by the public key that is actually presented on that server. So you could essentially write a separate registry that does find these websites based on their public keys, but very similar to phone numbers or IP addresses is they're not typically user experience. The, the, the user experience is not friendly because remembering the number versus remembering the name is obviously the name makes it much easier. So we don't have a DNS-based system for phone numbers, as an example, unless you, you go and uh, type it into your address book. And then we had aggregators, I think like Truecaller, I don't know if that's quite prolific where, for anyone on the call, I imagine it is, but that was a service of aggregation where anyone voluntarily exposes what they've captured in their local registry on their phone to the single authority that now has a, manages a list of everyone's name. So if you've ever shared your phone number with somebody that's got Truecaller running on their mobile, they're essentially voluntarily handing off your information to this aggregator, and the aggregator then uses that. So kind of like a DNS system for phone numbers, uh, that if you receive a call, it'll typically share you the name because it found that out of five or six of uh, your fellow contacts, address books, and that, that's kind of like how they deal with DNS. Um, 
but yeah, the, the public key cryptography side is you could essentially also do a registry for that, but nobody's going to remember to type in a public key. So you still need that friendly identifier. Exactly, but but my my opinion here and my point of view is that registries are red herring because you have phone numbers and you don't need a registry for it. You don't you, you don't actually look for what's the the phone number of my dad by the, by uh, his um, his uh, his phone name or whatever. You just add the, the, the phone number in your device and you trust the application layer to just give you a subjective name that you also to that phone and you just go from there. And similar actually experience you will find even in, in, in applications that have human readable identifiers. For example, whenever I want to, to mention uh, John, I don't, I don't remember every time to write at Bitcoin error log. I just write at and then start writing John. And I trust that Twitter go going to give me uh, an autocomplete that knows how to correlate John with uh, Bitcoin error log. So that's basically the, the subjective uh, point of view to identity that I, I believe in and I'm working on. Uh, with slash tags. So the point is, if I have a public key and I know your public key and I have your public key in my uh, contact book and I name that public key Grokshane, then I don't need a DNS. I don't need uh, a central registry. And the question is, why can't you start publishing data uh, that is discoverable using that public key? There's no need for uh, DNS there. There's no need for a certificate authority. I am the authority. I know your key and I trust your key because I, I talked to you in person and I added that key from talking to you. And my contact book should be the authority. And uh, the more we, we embrace that, the more we, we realize that uh, we don't need registries and we don't need human uh, readable identifiers that are also global. Let's just have human readable identifiers that are uh, local and subjective. And uh, obviously the problem that you mentioned with true colors uh, can't be solved uh, in any way because if I took your public key and then shared it with an aggregator, uh, with the name that I use for you, then that aggregator can make it public. But the question is, why would I share it with the aggregator? Because I don't need a, uh, a centralized registry, I wouldn't share it with, with an aggregator. So I think if we think about identity from that subjective point of view, we went both having, a, having real identity for, for users and not just people who are willing to run uh, web servers and go get a, a certificate uh, for their uh, HTTPS, uh, but also we enable people to discover each other's uh, content using their context contact book, or in our case, the contacts that they are associated with in, in their slash tags. So yeah, uh, so. I think that I definitely agree with you, R, and I, obviously that's why we're making the things we're making. Um, and I think not only our registries are red herring, but I also think that nicknames are red herring um, in that, like, there's been a lot of focus on, you know, domain names and searchable names and being able to find something by its name and everything looking nice to the user. Um, and even like you can see this, for example, with there's been a little bit of traction with things like lightning address. Um, and these are all kind of ways to emulate this culture of, of names. But in practice, most people aren't really remembering or typing or 
or, you know, relying on these names much, maybe the first time, but even then, like everything is very hyperlinked right now. And I don't mean, I mean that both literally and figuratively. And so you have like these autocompletes and these, you know, these systems that are within applications that are already making these associations for you. And you have these capabilities to automatically render these things into the names that you are used to seeing. And so I think that Bitcoin has is kind of like the first time where we've started to move the culture over to making people comfortable with the concept of a key pair. And so that I think that's why we're seeing more interest from companies like ours and companies and a company like um, TBD coming from, you know, Bitcoin perspectives, because it's the first time we've made it easy and, and practical for people to actually hold their own key pairs. And this is something that, you know, predecessors before Bitcoin really failed at, you know, PGP, GBG, um, just the capability of using encryption keys. Even if you own email, people, do, people have this capability in email clients and they mostly don't use it um, to encrypt their email with a key. And so now we have this capability to kind of anchor everything to keys if we cre- if we combine it with the user experience of Bitcoin and holding your keys for your for your money you can now also hold your keys for your accounts your contacts your your data you know your your files your your backups whatever everything can be associated with keys now if we if we combine it with the same user experience as for holding your keys for Bitcoin and that's basically the perspective we're trying to do and I think that if you have the capability to find data about a key, you know, uh, that is self-attested, you know, generated by that key holder, then you now have this ability to render things in applications based on that data automatically. So users can, for example, scan a QR code to add a friend or paste a, 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 a key into a chat room to like share, the, you know, who, who, what their key is. And then the application can automatically pull this data from a DHT and render it in a user-friendly way like my key can be john and you can also locally override the data if you don't if you want to have a pet name for that key that is not exactly what the key is attesting itself as so this subjectivity concept becomes really important Um, and so i'll use that as a transition to kind of you know contrast a little bit of these concepts with like maybe what Web five is from from what we can tell, and what it, what maybe we differ in in our in our designs and our approaches a little bit. I would say first of all, we mostly overlap. What 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 TBD is trying to do, and the kind of structure of the the pillars of their design are very very similar to the to a, how we imagine things should be done as well. But I would say there are some core differences in that. One, specifically, we do not use ION, um, we do not rely on DID yet, but we easily could support that, and we do not use IPFS. So just from a technical standpoint, um, we are creating slash tags kind of separately uh, to replace and, and, and use instead of ION. And one of the main reasons is we just have a more abstracted kind of outlook on how this should be done. And we don't feel like the need to necessarily describe the specification of the DID. And even more importantly, because we could do that easily and, and we, could, we could do both, we could have it our way and support DID. It's, it's not an issue. If it becomes a standard, we can easily support it within slash tags. But um, one, one more core difference is we don't actually believe in the justifications for including this identity system, including the Bitcoin blockchain. We just do not see a need to, in, to involve blockchain with these solutions. And we don't see, and we feel like this maybe is a mistake as far as like, um, you know, where, where Ethereum and shitcoiners were trying to use blockchain and trying to claim that, you know, blockchains made these things possible. It feels a little bit that way with, you know, Ion using the Bitcoin blockchain because we know it can be done without it now there is a very specific reason that that um that dan from tbd would give you for doing this we just aren't compelled by that reason and so thus we could 
just like with the ID, we could always add anchoring and key rolling of keys into any blockchain or Bitcoin if we really wanted to in the future with slash tags. But we have a, the other core difference here is that we generally have a more subjective view and priority for subjectivity and relativity within our vision for the web. So thus, we don't want to have things be anchored to the blockchain and be kind of... Uh, part of a, a system that where every single node is keeping copies of the data. We just don't feel that fits our own, you know, uh, our own design axioms and design principles for how what we choose to, to make decisions for our technology. We just, we feel that things need to be relative. And when it comes to web and network stuff, that only the people that, that need the data, want the data, or purchase the data, you know, there has to be relevance to the data that you hold. And so thus on the Bitcoin blockchain, it does not fit that design axiom for us for everybody to be holding even the smallest amount of identity key data if they're not involved with the identities that are being saved. And so thus there's a, 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 a at, at least a small scaling problem there. Um, maybe it never expresses because you can put many key updates into one transaction. But the truth is we can do it without any transactions on Bitcoin. And so thus we are not doing it that way. Um, but the rest of the stack, you know, is very, very similar. Their approach for using keys as a primitive, for using, you know, distributed systems for, for storage as a primitive, this is very similar. The difference there for us is we are using Hypercore instead of IPFS. And R would probably be better a person to go into detail as to why and what the difference is there technologically if if this time people want to hear it. But just generally speaking, Hypercore is a DHT using append-only logs, or as R puts it, personal blockchains. They're not actually blockchains. They're just like they're they're lo they're a log of data with integrity, and this allows you to have some qualities that people might attribute to blockchains. But what it does is it makes it very easy for you to scale and do this kind of relative, you know, uh, serving of data to have a kind of uh, distributed or decentralized cloud among peers. And so other people can serve your data for you in a way that has integrity and they know that it came from your key, even though it can't, even though it's being provided by a different slash tag key. Um, they can still show that the data was created by you and has integrity. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I ranted for a bit and that, that covers some of the differences and some of the similarities, but I would say mostly the approach is, is similar, but there are some core differences and that's why we don't necessarily call what we're doing Web5 because it's more their narrative and their approach and we don't really want to have to commit to some of the specific tech stack details at this time. Uh, I just uh, I just want to say that um, really we try to in slash tags build stuff as as simple as possible and only add features, especially complex features, when we are really convinced that we need it. So one of the two main uh, differences between slash tags and iron is that iron is embracing uh, key revocation uh, from a very fundamental. Uh, level, uh, we're still not convinced that this is uh, a, a use case that we need to support from the get go because we're, we're not sure yet that uh, people who are going to trust uh, revoked keys and re rotated keys uh, uh, while trusting that the master key itself is not um, uh, 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 leaked or, or lost or whatever. So, but also we still don't see why should we use the blockchain uh, to, to, to enable any of the use cases that we need. But I want to say that Bitcoin is still giving us an opportunity that wasn't uh, available before, not by putting stuff on the blockchain, but by leveraging the UX uh, familiarity that people have now with managing key pairs and actually invest, being invested in keeping their own keys. The fact that you have keys that hold your money that you care about and you want to keep uh, for long term makes it much more probable for people to keep and manage their key bears for their identity as well. 
Um, uh, yeah, and as for hypercool and hyperswarm, this is a very uh, long and complicated uh, discussion. But uh, just basically, the reason I personally prefer hyperswarm than lib P2P because it's it's a hole punching story. I'm just talking to developers now. If any developers are interested in the tech stack choice, the hole punching in hyperswarm is just much better and much easier than the B2B. The B2B might uh, evolve in the future and enhance on that, but right now HyperStorm is just much easier to do hole punching. And if you don't understand what hole punching is, it just basically means that you can make a DHT query and connection, even if you are in a home network that has that needs NAT traversal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it, you, it's really magical. When you when you just write few lines of code and suddenly you have a server that is listening on your device on a public key and you give it to someone else and they can send you a message or actually start writing text to you and you write text back to them and it just it's just magical and you can't do it any other way because if you don't have hyperstorm you will have local host you will make a, a web socket on your local host, but nobody can reach that local host. So if you are a developer and you are interested in that, come talk to us uh, on the slash tags Telegram or talk to me here on Twitter and I can just give you a quick demo about how amazing uh, this experience is. It's, it's really magical uh, to, 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 to run a server on a public key. It's, it's really amazing. But also hypercores, I can also walk you through how hypercores enable you and other peers to see the same data in a very optimized way uh, between peers. So basically, hypercore because it's an append-only list or an append-only log, the only API that you need to get the data, you don't go to, to uh, peers and ask them for a specific uh, API or whatever, uh, or, uh, or make a complex queries. You only ask them for a specific block at a specific point in the in the it, it's literally a blockchain because it's a chain of blocks so if you just tell them i want block number five and or ask the you peers do you have block number seven or what range of blocks do you have so the api is very simple and it, it basically allows you to treat any form of data like uh, a buffer of video so you can stream it from everywhere so it's you can think about it like watching uh, a, a, a movie um, on uh, a uTorrent or something like that, See, uh, getting data from all your peers when you need them. So it's really optimized for streaming. So that's also a reason why I think it's better for scalability. Um, yeah, but I, I just want to get back to one of the concepts that we mentioned about subjectivity. I want to, just uh, as an exercise, just Notice how many times do you search for something uh, or, or how many times do you call someone by writing their number versus how many times you just find them in your chat history? Or notice how many times do you get to a website by writing the URL, the full URL, versus how many times you just go to your address bar and just write any, any uh, word that is remotely relevant and suddenly get uh, an autocomplete or auto suggestion. So really, this is something that I believe in. That if if we embrace that model, we can make key pairs and decentralized identifiers really usable. And we are working hard on making an example of that. And that's why contacts and con having ha uh, bundling contacts in the slash tags experience is one of our first. Uh, our first main areas of focus. Okay, so a high level picture, John. Um, so the team is working on something called the atomic economy concept and a project which kind of, we went into great details already slash tag. So where does Synonym stand in all of this web one, two, three stuff? What's the, where, where does slash tags and synonym fit in? 
So I covered this a little bit in my last rant, but I'll, I'll use this as a, a way to explain atomic economy and maybe transition a little bit to topics about uh, like web of trust and circular economy. Um, atomic economy is kind of like our web five. Uh, we, we, we didn't intend it that way. What we were trying to do is just give an overview, ha have some kind of concept that explained everything that we're doing as a company. Um, so it involves, you know, the things we're building for Bitcoin, the applications we're building, the products, you know, the publishing platform and other things we're building, the, uh, the, the LSP for lightning connectivity that we're building, the slash tags protocol, the wallet, et cetera. It includes this whole concept of that we're trying to model what the internet and the, the kind of social economy would be like if Bitcoin were winning. And if it did win and we had this post hyper Bitcoinization, you know, environment, you know, what how would things actually work? You know, we, we killed big tech. We killed big government. We killed big, big banks. Like, what did we replace them with? And that's the idea with the atomic economy It's just to say, here is what we evolve into. And here are all the pieces of that puzzle. And we're going to build at least one reference, you know, implementation of every piece of this stack. So when Bitcoiners and the world are, is ready, they will have at least the stack as an option. And hopefully we are right and we will be right there, you know, we'll be building along with all the people entering, you know, hyper Bitcoinization and they'll have the tools that they're looking for. And so atomic economy is just, you know, on a high level, you know, everything I just said, but basically combining the concept of a circular economy with the concept, with, with the subjective stuff, like the, the web of trust and semantics. And so circular economy, just as a concept, very basically is the minimization of conversion. It's about efficiency. It's about matching people with the thing they're looking for with as little friction as possible. And so this is why we call it atomic economy because it's the most like, basic, simplest way to get to things. And there's always like a direct connection. And so we're trying to combine this concept of circular economy with the semantics and subjectivity stuff of slash tags as this glue to bring everything together with semantics. And so slash tags gives us a way to anchor metadata to keys in very, you know, in a very broad set of ways. Starting, for example, like I mentioned, with contact lists, website accounts, feeds, data feeds, etc. And so we're going to demonstrate these all one at a time within appropriate applications in a, in a proper priority order to show how you can use these and how this empowers users in different ways. And the, 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 this will eventually, not right now, it will still take more work. And I'll also mention that Web5 includes the concept of uh, webs of trust and, and a little bit of mentioning of semantics I found researching today. So there are still more similarities there, um, despite there being some differences. And web of trust is basically taking the same concept of a schema and schematics, I mean, a schema and semantics, and putting a weighting to it and having that weighting be sub both subjective and also a way to have this like a, a, a trust distance. In other words, a, you have a, a sort of transitive weighting that you can apply where you can say, okay, if I trust Grok Chain with his movie reviews, that means we're both using the same schema for metadata about movies and we are making attestations using our keys about these movies and when he provides a rating about a movie i think it's usually a pretty good rating and so when i am like looking for movies that are, that i want to watch or looking for ratings about movies i'm going to weight his data higher than other people's data and if i choose i may also weight the data of the people he prefers a little bit as well. And so I'll, I'll give them some, extra, some some points or some trust because I trust him, even though maybe I've never met them before and I don't know and I've never reviewed their data before. I might use this as a way of extending or branching out kind of like the concept of like seven degrees of separation. It's like using this, uh, this relativity to, uh, to apply a weighting so I can find what I'm looking for. It basically is a way of having like multiple schemas represented as, you know, uh, a weighting system. And it puts, it makes the users the Google search algorithm. So instead of like trusting a centralized server, 
each user is defining their own rule sets and their own weightings, and they're meeting mutually on the, the things that, that overlap. And so this is what we mean by atomic economy, combining these semantic webs of trust and weighting and reputation systems, essentially, and combining with this with a circular economy where everybody is you know, paying each other in Bitcoin um, and doing the most minimal amount of conversion that was required in order to both communicate, transfer data, and uh, have commerce together, essentially. All right. Um, last question before we open up the the stage for audiences. Uh, what should people keep in mind when evaluating all of these new web options? Um, Grok Shane, maybe you want to take that one. Yeah, look, I think obviously ju just making a distinction between Bitcoin and the web, I think a, a, a common thing, like I say, understanding that the web um, pretty much even version three promoted through W3C back in 2006 is really to keep the web as a platform for the freedom of speech, the, the freedom of information. And I think a lot of what we're seeing today, whether it's falling apart, is in terms of those freedoms being impeded. Um, so, I mean, I, I definitely think uh, in, in Bitcoin's instance, something we can learn from there is how prolific uh, public uh, key infrastructure has been uh, using cryptography to actually interact anonymously uh, with each other or pseudonymously on this platform for uh, exchanging data. Uh, um, uh, value has been a, a very good learning from there that we can move over to uh, the web. Um, but also... Uh, just getting to learn from some of the experiences of, of where individuals have fallen victim to uh, that not being the case. So be that the Aaron Schwartzes of the world, the Julian Assange's, Edward Snowden's, Russ Albrecht's, uh, that kind of have been the first through the door in suffering the lack of the technology, being able to protect those freedoms online. Uh, and then also having a look at initiatives like uh, the contract for the web.org, uh, the Free Software Foundation, I think those are very important uh, ideals to kind of like hold close in terms of uh, keeping the web free and open. Um, and then obviously also, uh, you know, just engaging with uh, talent that is willing to push this forward without doing it in a means that has a vendetta of vendor locking, like we saw with the early uh, instances of the web, uh, where vendors would like to gain that control uh, and kind of lock it down and impede those those uh, benefits. And definitely, in my experience, anyone who's promoting a future version of the web that's going to be driven by a token, I think is uh, a bit deceptive in nature um, and, and that you can more than likely get away with not doing that. Um, you can rather just focus on the public key cryptography side of it. Uh, there doesn't really need to be a token involved. Uh, to manage the incentives. And if there were to be, Bitcoin probably already does that for us. Thanks a lot, Cockchain. Are John, do you have anything to add? Or should we take questions from the audience or do you want to chat about something else? No, I think, I think I've talked enough. Um, R, if you have anything to add, go for it. No, same. Yeah, let's see if anybody has any questions. All right, we have questions from the audience. Uh, maybe John, you wanna like uh, pick pick who comes up? I don't actually know how to do it. <laughs> all, right, all right, let's let's get the first one on here. Okay, we have few. Let me kind of just get you on. And as a speaker, all right, a few, you're on. Few? What's your question? Yeah, yeah hey, uh, what was that project that uh, R was talking about? Uh, the hype, was it Hypercore? Yeah, Hypercore, Hypercore is a project. It's kind of like similar to BitTorrent. 
but it is you know a, a more, more maybe maybe more modernized and more intentional for decentralized web use cases but yeah you you can if you search google for hypercore you'll find the, the main website it's an open source project and there's tons of utilities and and you know github repos and modules for it that you can play with cool alternatively i will mention part of what we're doing with our work with slash tags is actually making it very easy to use hypercore for the use cases related to key pairs and so you could actually potentially start from our slash tags repo in github if you wanted to play with the things related to this conversation with hypercore yeah, I would say the same. Uh, we built something called slash tags SDK, which basically tries to uh, bundle everything that we need from Hypercore and Hyperswarm, but make it uh, a bit easier and more documented and with a bit of type definitions to make it easier for developers to pick up and use without having to be very experienced in Hypercore and Hyperswarm. But uh, if if you have any if you try to play with it and if you have any questions, let me know because there is a, a bit of a learning curve and there are I, I just can't save you a lot of time if uh, if you ask me a few questions about it. Yeah, I'll echo that and add that um, you know the the SDK is not formally launched yet. It is we, we have been working in public for the most part with slash tag stuff, so you can kind of watch R as he works and and the rest of the guys as we implement. But um, we are only implementing it ourselves now for the first time in our own app. Um, that the app isn't public yet, but um, so so there are going to potentially be sub, you know substantial changes to it. So I wouldn't like build it into your system necessarily, but you could definitely hack with it and get to know it and play with it and it works and you can implement it. But just, I just want to disclaim that it's not formally released and thus there are going to potentially be changes that for the better we will make after we've implemented it ourselves in our own product. True, true. It's still not, not stable, but Hypercore and Hyperstorm itself are getting out of alpha very soon. So. Yeah, I encourage everyone who wants to uh, explore these uh, primitives. And again, I iterate, please reach out because there's some learning curve there. When we do formally release it, we'll, we'll be sure to make it easier to use and have a lot more hand-holding and content and demos and demo apps and things like this to play with to make it all very easy and obvious and, and fun to play with. So, but for the moment, it's for you know people who are particularly enthusiastic. Thank you, Phil. Um, do, we, do, we, do we have more questions from anybody? Please raise your hands if you have questions. No questions so far. Is there anything else you... Okay, we have a question from Flo. Okay, let's go flow up. Add him as a speaker. Yeah. Flow's connecting right now. Hey. Flow, the stage is hey, yours. Cool. Uh, just wondering what your thoughts are on uh, this thing called unstoppable domains. Just curious what you guys think about that. So I'm going to make some assumptions here because I haven't researched it fully specifically. I'm sure I looked at it at some point. But all of these domains that, you know, if you... Um, can can parse a lot of what we were saying today. Part of what you can infer from a lot of what we're talking about is the concept of owning a domain name after this next web becomes popularized, regardless of who popularizes it. It's kind of dead. Um, th this this idea that you can own a unique name is only provided by an authority. That means that there has to be somebody else who decides who owns the names. And so this concept of unstoppable domains, it's kind of, I'm going to assume, a lie. Um, and maybe part of this, the, the theme of Web of Lies here. Much like, you know, dot .BTC domains from, block, from stacks are a lie. Dot .ETH domains are a lie. Like, the only way you can have a limited namespace is if you have some sort of authority governing that namespace. 
And that isn't even useful when you consider if everything can be represented by a pub key. Now, the metadata can be something either you decide or they attest to, or you could even have it be like, for example, I could say, I believe that this key is google.com. And then my friends ask me, where is google.com? And I say, it's this key. And they say, okay, but somebody told me that google.com is this other key. And then you could just decide which, which key is google.com based off of who you trust the most. And that's kind of what's already happening. It's just that everybody is converging to trust one major domain registrar. But when you use something like the stacks.btc domains, which I assume is going to be similar to how Unstoppable Domains works, what you're actually doing is you're installing some middleware that, that basically tells your web browser where to go to a normal IP address, a normal server, when you type in a domain name. It basically intercepts the info and sends you to the right place. So it overrides your browser's typical DNS you know, behavior, and it uses their own sort of side DNS system. And so the only enforcement there is going to be from whoever that authority is that's making that application middleware that's telling your browser where to go. And if you ask, if like you buy, say, for example, a .btc domain or .ens or .eth and you tell your mom to go to your website, nothing will happen because she doesn't have that middleware and it, then she's not asking the same DNS provider for the location of that server. And so the difference with what we're trying to do with using key pairs is that it doesn't matter you know, uh, what the domain name is. What matters is who owns that key. And when you're searching for something, what you're actually searching for is data about a key. I hope, I hope that all that makes sense. Yeah, so would you be putting it into, from what you're doing, would you just put uh, that into one of those keys into the web browser as though you would just type in a website or how... In well, this is, so yes and no. The, the issue here is if you wanted it to work in your current web browser, your web browser, you either need middleware like they're doing, or you, but, the, but in this case, the middleware is not pointing to an authority. It's pointing to a public network. And so thus, there is no, there's nobody that can own a domain name, but you can own a key because it's unique and you can prove it's unique and that only you have it because you can sign with it. Um, but you still need browsers that are compatible with it if you want it to work in a web browser. But what you could do, for example, is you could have uh, a phone app, say, where you store your keys, like your slash tags, for example, and your phone app can store only the keys. And you could say, okay, um, this is bitfinex.com's key. And then when you tap on that key, when you tap on that account, what it will do is it will it will look at the DHT and it will ask where is Bitfinex's server, and then it will take you to that website using a normal web browser without ever having to actually use the domain name itself necessarily. Um, you would probably still just use the URL, the domain name, because it currently is the convention. But you could also just send them directly to the server IP. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Thanks for answering. Yeah, I'll maybe yeah, I will maybe also add on to that, John. I think uh, for anyone who's familiar w with like ICANN's internet, um, DNS today is obviously managed through a handful of root servers that bubble down to these uh, kind of separate network entities. And uh, essentially the unstoppable domains guys uh, have gone the route of not actually registering as a typical registrar but are trying to manage a record of domains on a blockchain system itself and then write their own separate resolver, uh, as John indicated, for which you might need a plugin so that uh, typical DNS queries with any tools you use would go through the ICANN chain of root servers, et cetera, to do the resolution. Uh, and their extension, for example, would also uh, then do an additional search on their registry. But essentially all those initiatives do is they try to establish another registry or central point at which uh, uh, kind of like these mappings get, get managed. Um, and I did a bit of an experiment, I think about two weeks ago, uh, where if you're familiar, let's say, with the Bitcoin network, every Bitcoin node that gets fired up on the network also has kind of a user agent string that it can expose. 
This is typically configured in your Bitcoin.com file as the UA comment field, I believe. So if you talk to a Bitcoin node, uh, you can actually, during the initial handshake with that node, uh, obtain that user agent string, uh, which means that if you troll the peer-to-peer -peer network through the, the gossip of how you actually find Bitcoin uh, nodes on the network to converse with, you can build up a registry on your own local machine that has a mapping of these user agent strings to the public IP or onion routed address, uh, which means you can essentially kind of like, it's like deriving DNS to an extent. And I did an experiment, actually got a, a server up and running where you can find anyone's Bitcoin node purely just by knowing what that user agent string is. Uh, now that goes the inverse where you can manage that registry yourself, very similar to editing your host file on your local machine, which can typically be used to even override uh, the name lookups you get with uh, like ICANN's DNS. Uh, but the idea is, uh, like, like John even says, is can you get it to a point where resolution is being done without depending on a central authority actually managing that registry? So it should rather be inferred from the network itself as opposed to querying this one entity that um, th that exposes it. And I think, uh, yeah, the unstoppable domains thing is just trying to reincarnate a single registry, but without going through the red tape, like with ICANN and, and insisting that that registry get managed on a blockchain, which personally I think is inefficient. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the ideals of getting that publicly managed uh, without using a blockchain are more feasible. I just want to say, if 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 you or but you you have to know that domain somewhere, right? You can't just wake up in the morning and find a, a domain from from your mind. You have to see the domain somewhere first. So you either are going to find it on a search engine, or you're gonna hear about it from someone else, or the owner of the domain are you gonna tell you, hey. Uh, add my RSS feed, here is my domain name, or uh, follow me on Twitter or something like that. So if you obtained that domain, then, then think about if you obtain the public key, just put it on your contact book, just uh, augment your web browser with that contact list that you have. You already need to know the domain at least once whether it's from a, a search engine or a, any other form of a, an aggregator. So why do you need a domain name system? The only unstoppable naming system is your contact list. So uh, ideally, your, your browser would have access to your private contact list uh, that is authored by you, that you uh, collected from anywhere, and then hopefully web browsers in the future will understand uh, your aliases and uh, resolve these aliases to the actual public key that gets you the decentralized uh, data. So I don't understand why do we need a registry in the first place if we need to know the domain manually. So why not just know the key and then alias it and keep our own list of uh, names to keys registry. Yeah, and I, I think the reason that exists today is mostly because of uh, like brand protection and uh, name squatting and having a regulatory framework in th th that's been built due to it existing that way for brands to protect themselves. I mean, I had an issue uh, with quite a big certificate authority, it must have been over 15 years ago, where in South Africa, I registered their name under our country level uh, uh, TLD. And uh, they literally got bullied out of it because, well, they weren't registered here in, in South Africa, uh, but essentially uh, they confiscated the domain because even a domain in ICANN sense, does ne it never belongs to the person that actually registered it. A good example, today, google.co.za uh, actually was offline. Uh, because Google neglected to actually renew that domain with the, lo the, the local registrar. Um, but essentially, you're just renting that name from the registrar. And I agree with R. I think there, there are better alternatives where we can get away with doing that resolution in a more kind of like web of trust manner. 
And then instead of bullying people in protecting your brand, you can rather do it on a reputation basis. So if your contacts suggest that this brand belongs to Microsoft, then essentially that is the one you go with. So it should be more reputation based as opposed to enforced through uh, regulatory bodies. Awesome. So we going two hours strong and I just want to close it here and kind of like, please, uh, John R. Grokchain, kind of like, please close it off. Tell people where they can find you, how they can contact you if, if they just kind of want to take some conversations offline. Sure. Uh, I'm obviously a Bitcoin error log on Twitter. If you would like to follow me, um, our company Twitter is synonym underscore T-O, synonym two. Um, at, same for our website, synonym dot T-O. Uh, yeah. Uh, also check out our GitHub. It's uh, The org is called synonym dev and you can find slash tags there. You can find a lot of other stuff that we've put out, all the block tank stack of software for Lightning. Um, and we'll keep putting out more libraries. Um, Grokchain actually has a work in progress for an LDK Lightning node in JavaScript that you can start to play with and even contribute to if you're interested. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, and from my side, Crockchain uh, on Twitter, pretty much anyone who's on Spaces can just click my name there. And more than happy, yeah, always open. DMs are open if you want to have any conversations, man. Yeah, same here. I'm available here and uh, on GitHub. Uh, you can find me from going to the uh, Synonym Dev uh, organization. Uh, you will find me working on slash tags and I'm happy to answer your question on the DM. But finally, uh, I just want to say, hopefully, that question, uh, where can I find you, will be answered uh, like a year or two from now by just uh, finding my slash tags uh, on my bio or something like that. Or maybe ask you Web of Trust. I'll also mention, if you want to chat with R or any of us about any of this tech, um, you can find our Telegram room by visiting chat.synonym.to. So chat.synonym.to uh, URL, and that will take you to our Telegram room. Then last, last but not least, uh, very simple question to kind of like sign off. I know we know about price, but let's put a price on it. John Bitcoin end of year 31st of December 2022 price. What's your prediction? Just one number. <laughs> uh, 69k. Okay, R. What's what's your number? Uh, 15k. <laughs> 15. <laughs> oh my God, we got some bears here. Grokchain, uh, what what's the number? Thirty uh, first of December two thousand twenty two, Bitcoin price. Yeah, I measure my time in Bitcoin. My time's priceless, so that's my price, man. All right, that's the answer we were looking for. 